Kevin Camps is with us. He is the uh, nuclear waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear, beyondnuclear.org. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Tom. We just had a fellow from the Breakthrough Institute telling us how wonderful nuclear power was. Mm. Uh, actually, he was trying to. He, he, we kind of got sidetracked on carbon taxes and my being crazy. But in any case, I understand that, uh, A, the, the guy who is sort of the original hero of Fukushima, who stayed and tried to keep the plant from melting down, just died of cancer. And, yeah. B, that uh, some of the nuclear watchdogs in, in the Fukushima area in Japan are saying that there's just a naked leak of radiation into the ocean. Uh, take your choice, whichever one you want to talk about first. Well, Yoshida, you know, he did defy Tokyo Electric when they told him to stop cooling the melting down reactors with salt water because they wanted to preserve them for future commercial use, which was insane. They were so in denial. And he disregarded their orders and he cooled as best he could the reactors with salt water. Unfortunately, he could not stop them from melting down. And, uh, you know, the devil's in the details as to how much radioactivity has gotten out, but that's the latest news that you're saying that's breaking, is that, you know, it looks like uh, the New York Times reported just today, based on the Nuclear Regulatory Authority's chief spokesperson, that the leaks have been going on for two years into the ocean from Fukushima. Yikes! Yikes! And they have surged recently in the last days and weeks to much higher levels, uh, something like a hundred times the level of cesium and strontium and tritium that's been previously seen in the groundwater near the seaside and even in the ocean itself just offshore. Wow. So he admitted they don't know where the leak is occurring. They don't know how to stop it. So, and cesium does what to the human body? Cesium is a muscle seeker, and it has caused, for example, in Ukraine and Belarus and Russia, a condition called Chernobyl heart, even in children, which is holes in the heart congenitally. Okay, and strontium does what to human beings? Strontium is a bone seeker that causes various uh, bone maladies, including in the bone marrow. Including bone cancer and leukemia? Yeah. Okay, and what was the third element you said? Uh, tritium, which is radioactive hydrogen, which is also a clinically proven cause of cancer and birth defects and genetic damage. And this stuff is just literally pouring out of Fukushima right now as we speak. They have uh, like 100 tons or more of leakage into the uh, basement levels of water, groundwater, on a regular basis, and that's where it's picking up its contamination and then leaking apparently into the ocean after that. And that, that's the same Pacific Ocean that ends up from Oregon all the way down to Southern California on our side of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, and the uh, ocean currents, even uh, certain forms of uh, you know, seafood like tuna actually bring it over here pretty quickly because they're actually swimming, you know, migrating. So, uh, you know, it's the bioaccumulation in the food chain that we really need to worry about. Some people might try to dismiss this as not important because the ocean is so big, the radioactivity will dilute, but the bioaccumulation is what reverses that process, and we sit at the top of the food chain. Right. Now, I know, you know, sometime back we talked, and you were telling me about efforts, volunteer groups who are putting together monitoring stations, both for air and water, but also uh, looking for things like cesium in, in the fish. Uh, yeah. What's the status of that? Well, the... Uh, Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network is one of the, the great um, coalitions happening in North America, and they're really uh, urging the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to take this issue seriously, to put official federal monitoring at a much higher alert level on the food that's you know coming from the ocean, that's even being imported from Japan, because our regulations are much weaker than Japan's. Japan allows for 100, 100 becquerels per kilogram of radioactive cesium in food. Beyond that, it's considered unfit for human consumption. Incredibly, in the U.S., the standard is 1,200 becquerels per kilogram. So we Whoa. usually be importing Japanese contaminated food into the United States. Whoa. And is, is this uh, Japanese contaminated food that is too radioactive for Japan, so they're exporting it? You're talking about seafood? Uh, all, all food. Um, even crops that are being grown, not just in Fukushima Prefecture, but in adjacent prefectures. So, it's like rice? Yes, you name it. I mean, I've uh, checked the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, website from time to time to see the list grow of the various foods that are being contaminated in Japan and at, at certain different levels. Now, this is, 
this is what could be and what the levels are, what is actually being measured? You have, you know, like, uh, you know, hey, this group of, of 15 people in Portland, Oregon just discovered, you know, in this restaurant, you know, salmon that kicks a Geiger counter at this point. Is there anything like that? I think it's still in the initial stages to try to set up those kind of systems. I mean, it's even been forced on the people of Japan to do their own food analysis because their government, which is in bed with the nuclear industry, isn't doing anywhere near an adequate job. So, for example, there's a family in uh, Kyoto, I'm sorry, in Osaka, that has set up its own food monitoring system. They paid something like 10000 or $15,000 to acquire it from Ukraine, of all places, who have hmm. to deal with the aftermath of Chernobyl. And they are checking the food not only for their own children, but for their children's schoolmates. And mm -hmm. so they've set up kind of a single elementary school covering its own children's food supply. But that's... And what are they finding? Well, um, I haven't heard recently, but they are on guard against uh, their children eating any contaminated food above a certain level. Yeah, amazing. And that above the certain level, the, the, that's where the devil's in the details, because there is no safe level of radiation. That's right. Artificial radioactivity is harmful. Very the risk of yeah. cancer. Yeah, period. No nukes. Beyondnuclear.org is the website. Kevin Camps, the Nuclear Waste Watchdog. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, thank you, Tom. Always great talking to you. If you want more information, get over to beyondnuclear.org. We'll be right back. A team of Japanese researchers is expressing concern more than two years after the accident at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. They found high levels of radioactivity in fish almost 100 kilometers from the plant. The scientists caught several Japanese sea bass off Hitachi City that contain levels of radioactive cesium exceeding 1,000 becquerels per kilogram. The amount is more than 10 times the government safety limit. In April 2011, several other fish caught in the same area also contained levels of cesium above 1,000 becquerels. The researchers are trying to find out why fish are still tainted more than two years after the accident. I appreciate the tenor of the conversations. Uh, I think it will actually yield results uh, before the end of the year, and I look forward to continuing this dialogue in the months ahead. Thank you very much, everybody. This week, we learned that the manager of Japan's crippled Fukushima nuclear plant, Masao Yoshida, died from cancer. His illness reportedly had nothing to do with the radiation levels at the Fukushima plant that he worked in around the clock alongside a group of men referred to as the Fukushima 50 trying to contain the nuclear crisis in the days and months following the earthquake and tsunami. But although Mr. Yoshida's cancer can't be traced back to Fukushima, how many others in Japan may contract cancer in the future that can be traced back to Fukushima? On Tuesday, radioactive contamination of groundwater at the plant surged to levels 90 times greater than they were just three days ago. So what effect is the ongoing Fukushima nuclear crisis having in Japan, and what lessons should we be learning in the United States? Kevin Camps is here. He's the radioactive waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear. Kevin, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, Sam. So let's start in Japan. What's the latest when it comes to Fukushima, when it comes to Japan, in the short term, as far as getting the situation under control, and then in the long term, when it comes to what sort of health effects we might see from, from all these dosages of radiation over the last few years? Well, the best word I can come up with for what's happening in recent days and weeks at Fukushima Daiichi is hemorrhaging of radioactivity. And the scariest part of all is that they don't know where it's coming from. But ultimately, it's coming from three melted-down atomic reactor cores and severely damaged, if not entirely destroyed, radiological containment structures. That's where it's ultimately coming from, but why it's getting out now in such a hurry, all of a sudden, is the big mystery. And this is despite the fact that they have growing tank farms that are stretching now off-site, kind of into the hillsides, holding just countless hundreds and thousands of tons of highly radioactively contaminated water, some of which we know are also leaking. So what it looks like is that this leakage at a faster rate or a slower rate has been going on for over two years at this point. And this really is a, a crisis that 
the world has never confronted before this sort of nuclear crisis. I mean, we've had nuclear crisis, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island. This one at Fukushima is different. Um, so they're kind of flying by the seat of their pants trying to contain it. And here we are, more than two years past it, and you say we have these tanks now being lined up. How long can this continue to go on? Uh, it seems like an impossible situation. And you know what Tokyo Electric has tried to get away with is convincing the government, the people in the area, the fishermen especially, that releasing some of the contents of those tanks might be an okay thing to do. And they haven't gotten away with it yet, intentionally releasing. But what's going on is unintentional, it's out of control, leakage pathways that they claim not to even know about. How much of the Fukushima disaster was caused, or at least made worse, by the design of the plant itself? And if that's the case, if it was made worse or caused by this, this design, should we in the United States be concerned because we have plants of similar designs? We have 23 identical designs to Fukushima Daiichi in the United States operating, including the oldest reactor in this country, Oyster Creek, New Jersey. We've now seen on live television two years ago what these things are capable of in terms of the explosions and the meltdowns. They knew as early as 1972 at the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission that this design of containment was too small and too weak, and yet they continued to license these things. And we've lived with a game of uh, Russian roulette in terms of the safety risks for 40, dec for 40 years now. These are also building designs that include putting these waste pools at the top of the building, which has proven to be a pretty big problem in the cleanup at Fukushima. That's the other shoe that we hope will never drop, but it's, it's precarious at this point. Unit 4 at Fukushima Daiichi could collapse if there's another big earthquake, and the cooling water in that high-level radioactive waste storage pool could be lost suddenly. Within hours, that waste could be on fire. The situation in the U.S. is that we have uh, multiple times more waste in our pools than is contained in Unit 4, and they are vulnerable to various natural disasters or terrorist attacks or accidental drops of heavy loads that could drain the water away. Or potentially earthquakes and, yes. and other natural disasters. I mean, Fukushima, yeah. that was caused by an earthquake and, and, and a tsunami that came through. Um, how many plants in the United States are in similar precarious situations on fault lines or on coasts or near flood flooding zones. I think we had one, uh, I forgot what state it was last year, that came dangerously close to being flooded. Well, uh, Fort Calhoun in Nebraska has now been shut down for over two years uh, since uh, April of 2011 because of the flooding out there, the damage that was done to the underground facilities. And just like in Japan, we are looking at the uh, imminent restart of that reactor despite the damage done, and they don't know how bad it is underground. So in Japan, they're trying to restart reactors despite Fukushima Daiichi. We have dozens, scores of reactors in various vulnerable situations to natural disasters. We did recently move to have reactors shut down at the San Onofre uh, nuclear facility uh, last month. How much of that would, do you think was influenced by what we saw happening in Fukushima, um, if at all? Or is this just kind of a one-off, here we are being careful about nuclear power in this instance while letting all these plants continue un, you know, relatively unchecked in dangerous areas? Well, there has been a groundswell of concern among the American public post-Fukushima, because now folks have seen on live television what American reactor designs are capable of. But I should hasten to say that there are watchdogs in California who have been in the trenches for four decades out there, watchdogging San Onofre. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was not the one who shut down San Onofre. It was the utility itself. The NRC was doing all it could to keep this utility viable. But it was the intervention of groups like Friends of the Earth and grassroots groups who just shined a very bright spotlight on the damage at that facility and showed that it was dangerous to 8 million people if they ever restarted that thing. Uh, in the last 10, 15 seconds, what has Fukushima done for the movement to, for the no-nukes movement? Well, I think, you know, the fallout that hit the United States that is still going into the ocean has shown people that the food is contaminated to an extent, and uh, people have to be careful what they're eating, and people are getting involved on the local level. The nukes in their neighborhood, they're, they're fighting to shut them down. Right. Kevin Camps, the radioactive waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear, thank you so much. Thank you.